Session number 9709, Lieutenant Commander George Honor, Real One. Could you tell me, first of all, Commander Honor, how you came to volunteer for midget submarines in the first place? In the middle of 1942, shortly after the Valiant and the Queen Elizabeth had been attacked by Italian midget submariners, our commander came round and said they were looking for volunteers for hazardous underwater work. The qualifications were that you were able to swim and were single. As I qualified for both these things, I had my name put down. Very shortly after, I was flown home from the Mediterranean, put through the deep diving tank at HMS Dolphin, and accepted for midget submarines. At the time, there was a choice. One could either go into chariots, where you sat on the gadgets, or into x crafts themselves, which carried a crew of four people. Can you tell me what chariots were? Uh, chariots were literally two torpedoes uh, connected together, and the crew of two sat on the top one and drove them to their target. Why did you make that choice? Uh, I rather liked my comforts, and the x crafts of course, had bunks and cooking facilities. <laughs> Can you tell me about the X-Craft themselves? Can you give a detailed description of them? Uh, the X-Craft were really midget miniature submarines. They were approximately 52 foot long, some 5 foot in diameter, had a range of 1,000 miles, and a duration at sea of up to 10 days. And the size of the crew? Uh, the normal crew were four a commanding officer, a first lieutenant, an engineer, and a diver. And your own role was to be? I was captain from the start. What kind of comforts did you have inside the submarine? What was it actually like to live and work aboard? The, the uh, facilities were very cramped. But we did have bunks, a cooking pot, a glue, called a glue pot, so we could get a hot meal. And uh, generally, you could just about stand if you were short in the control room. What about the armaments? The armaments were two two-ton charges, which were chamfered to the side of the craft, and the object was to detach them underneath your target. So there was, there was no question of torpedoes? No. Uh, they were purely for attacking enemy craft in harbour or in anchorages. Can you tell me the type of training that you had? The training was very, very fast because we needed to use these craft as soon as possible. And we all did an engineering course, a navigational course, general fitness, we used to cut trees down up in Scotland and uh, do runs and things, and the object being to keep us at the peak of fitness. Was there any part of the training which you personally didn't like? No, I enjoyed it all. Was there any part of the training that you specially did like? Uh, I think the best part was the the fact that you were a small crew working together for one object. Why do you think being in a small unit was an advantage? I always had been in the smaller units in the Navy and uh, I always liked them better than big ships. Because of the anonymity of the big ships you mean? Yes, too many people. I, I think you got lost in a big ship. Did you, as the commanding officer, have any choice as to your crew? Yes, we picked our own crews right from the start. And who did you pick to start off with? Um, I picked a young chap called Jimmy Hodges as my first lieutenant, and an ERA called Vaws, B-A-U-S-E. The diver that uh, they came uh, 
There were different ones from time to time. There was no set one. Why did you choose Hodges and Boz? I, I had been the training officer for the Fatilla, and I was lucky there because I had seen them all working and was able to pick what I thought was the best. Had you worked with them before? Yes, I had, because when I first got up to HMS Varbell, the headquarters for midget submarines in Scotland, I was lucky enough to get command of X4, one of the two prototypes. X3 and X4 started the whole thing. X3, unfortunately, was sunk through leaving an air hole open, and so X4 did pretty well carry the whole of the training which meant, virtually, I saw all the crews as they came through for training. Was there loss of life with the X-3? No, no loss of life. They all escaped. Did that loss have any effect on morale? None at all, no. The only thing it had an effect on was the fact we were short of one craft for training, which put all the weight onto X-4. Was there much change in the design uh, once the prototype, prototype was tested? Oh, yes, the great improvements. When the X-10 class came out, they were greatly improved on the original two. What kind of improvements? Uh, well, we started off by having one man controlling both the diving uh, controls and the steering controls. And we found this was virtually impossible if you kept your eye on the course he went too deep, and vice versa. It's uh, almost impossible one man. So they separated the controls and had one man controlling the depth and another controlling the navigation and steering. That was the biggest improvement. Which members of the crew were there? Anyone. All, crew, all members of the crew were interchangeable. We all trained to do any job, including diving. We were all divers. How did you personally take to the diving job? Um, never liked it very much, um, but did it. And could, were you able to deal with the engine as well? Yes, we all did an engineering course. The, these craft were driven by a, an old, a bus engine, a diesel bus engine, and we all did diesel course so we could handle the, the engine if necessary. And uh, we all did a full electrical course to deal with the motors and the batteries. Did you find that in practice there were any problems or defects with the engines? The engines were supreme, never gave any trouble at all. What about the explosive charges? Were they, did they um, handle satisfactorily? Yes, they were, they were very, very well designed. And uh, apart from trouble on the Tirpitz uh, attack, when one or two flooded up, there was little trouble. I think we should say that you weren't actually on the Tirpitz attack. Yes, I wasn't on the Tirpitz, but I was on the staff at the time and knew what had happened. When you were on the staff with the Tirpitz attack, can you, can you recollect um, how the news came in of what had happened? Uh, I remember it filtering through uh, sometime after the actual attack. Bits of news came through uh, various ways. I think lots of it from the uh, Norwegian resistance. And how did people react when they got the news? Oh, very pleased, of course, that it had been a successful operation. The Tirpitz was virtually um, out of commission as a fighting uh, unit, later to be finished off by the RAF. Now, did you go on any operations before D-Day? No. no. So what, what kind of work were you doing in the months before D-Day? Well, about mid-43, 1943, it was decided to detach two X-craft for beach reconnaissance and beach marking on D-Day. Uh, Ken Hudspeth, who had command of X-20, the other craft, uh, went down to Gosport very early in 1944 and was able to make two trips across to the actual beaches. Um, by the time I got down there in X-23, 
it was decided no more trips would be undertaken as it was feared it would jeopardize the, the landings. Had he got across undetected? They went across completely undetected. They landed various scientific people who took samples of the beaches and they also landed two Royal Engineers, Major Scott Bowden and Corporal Ogden Smith, who I think did one of the most cold-blooded jobs in the war. They went along the beaches with a mine detector and dug up mines and brought samples back, which uh, gave a very good clue to what type of mines would be encountered for the landings. How was it that they weren't blown up? Uh, they had their own mine detectors and the corporal walked along with the mine detector and the major was behind him and if there were any movement of Germans he'd tap him to get down. But by sweeping, they were sweeping ahead and therefore could avoid the mines and dig them up. And they actually took samples of the beach material, did they? Beach materials, they took, uh, they dug poles into the beach and found what weight of tank or armoured vehicle could land on the various beaches. This was all, of course, very, very useful information. And particularly for the spot where we were going to mark the beaches, where the DD tanks, the swimming tanks, were going to land, had to be sure that they would be able to climb up the beaches. Did you have anything to do with the planning of that operation? Uh, I was in touch all the time being down there and uh, of course we had to know when the invasion was coming and uh, what was going on so uh, we, we knew we were pretty well in the picture which was a little worrying knowing all the, the dates and things. So you must have been one of the few people in Britain to know I the should actual think it was, place and debt of the invasion? Yes, I think it was very limited at that stage but having uh, our other craft having gone across and done this reconnaissance, it was pretty obvious that uh, that was where we were planning to go. Can you tell me about your own personal D-Day preparations? Um, we did a dummy run at Slapton Sands. I can't remember quite the month. It was about three months before the actual invasion. And we did an absolute as far as we were concerned, a complete run of what we were going to do. We marked our position and uh, surfaced and put up our gadgets and this convinced us we could do it. It was the only, only trial we had. Unfortunately, right in the middle of the uh, invasion, we had a signal from submarine headquarters to pack up and go into, uh, into oh dear, wait a minute, Portland, and this was because some e-boats got amongst the other invasion forces and, and did a lot of damage, the loss of some 400 American lives. But we got clear and went back to Portland, so we didn't suffer. Did you actually see the e-boats? No, we were clear and back to Portland before any trouble. But this was on the practice at Slapton? This was on this big practice where they had terrible trouble. Now. Can you describe in detail what the plan was for your own particular craft at D-Day? Yes, we were to leave on the night of Friday the 2nd of June to cross the 90 miles from Gosport to France and to land at a fixed position off Weistrom. We actually arrived on the morning of Sunday the 4th of June. We marked our position through the periscope and sat on the bottom till nightfall. On the Sunday night we surfaced, dropped our anchor so we would stay right on our marking position, hoisted our radio mast and we got a signal that the invasion had been postponed. It should have been on Monday the 5th. So then we had to retreat to the bottom again and wait till the Monday night. On the Monday night, we again surfaced and received a message that the invasion was on. So once again, we went down, sat on the bottom, and at about 4.30 a.m. on Tuesday the 6th of June, we surfaced again, 
put up all our navigational aids, 18-foot telescopic masts with a light shining to seaward, a radio beacon, and an echo sounder tapping out a message below the surface. Uh, this was for the navigational MLs to pick up as they brought the invasion force in. What was the tension like as you were waiting? I think by that stage that the main tension was the postponement because we were on oxygen fed to us automatically from air bottles and when we had the postponement it didn't say how long it was for and so we had this awful problem would we have enough oxygen if the invasion hadn't come on the Tuesday but once we knew it was coming the tension went we had a job to do and I think then we just went ahead and, and did our job. Which particular beaches were you marking? We were on the Sword Beach, about a mile and a quarter offshore at Wiestrom. And do you know which particular units were going in at your point? Uh, no, we only knew that the DD tanks would be launched all around us from the tank landing craft and they would form up and swim ashore under their own power. They were in flotation bags, great big canvas bags, and carried two propellers. And sure enough, they were launched all round us. And apart from one or two which were swamped and sank, they did proceed inshore and climb up the beaches, which I think was a very uh, great help to the actual invasion. What did you see uh, of the shore? Did you see anything of the Germans themselves and their armaments? Um, we could see on the Sunday, we did a periscope reconnaissance, and we could see a little bit of activity, vehicles rushing about all along the front at Wiestrom, and uh, one of the main things we saw was a lorry load of Germans arrived, and they started uh, playing beach ball and swimming. And... Uh, in the back of my mind, I thought, I hope there are no Olympic swimmers here and they don't swim out a mile offshore and find where we were. But of course they didn't and that was all well. But the interesting part was, here were the Germans having obviously a, a Sunday afternoon um, recreation and uh, they little did they know what was sitting, waiting for them on the Monday. Or that you were just a mile away. Or that we were there, of course. They... Our little operation was called Gambit. It was all part of the big operation. And when we had this code name given us, we went along and looked it up in the dictionary. And much to our horror, it said, the pawn you throw away before a big move in chess, which didn't encourage us too much. Was there any nervousness about the operation before you went, or did you feel confident? I think the main nervousness was the fact that we knew the, da the dates. And timing. Um, this was a little worry. Obviously, one kept very quiet, and that was that. But uh, I think one would have preferred if it didn't know the date so long before. Was there any breach of security, to your knowledge? As far as we know, there was not the slightest breach. It all went exactly according to plan, and fell into line beautifully. Everything arrived on time and, and, and worked extremely well. But presumably, if you'd been captured, it would have been rather dicey, having known, known, having information which w was invaluable. Yes, this was one of the things. Um, we were given passport photos, and we had all kinds of plans that we could get ashore, and if possible, to contact the French resistance, and they would give us with uh, false passports and whisk us back through some unknown way. Uh, I personally don't think uh, we should have got far off the beach if we had got to shore. And I can imagine some great Hun with a, with a rifle sort of sticking his bayonet into you and uh, saying, what are you doing, or something like that. Um, and probably they'd extract some of the information for us. We don't know what would have happened. But uh, I think it would have been very, very hard to have got ashore on that heavily fortified coast and, uh, and managed to contact anybody. But obviously they had to give us a, a way out, and uh, 
It was very well planned. It didn't give us a loophole. Shouldn't the worst have happened? But presumably aboard the submarine you were in British naval uniforms. Oh yes, we had uh, uniform sorts on anyway. Probably our oldest bits, but uh, and we had caps of course and we did look um, like naval officers, yes. Now you said you saw the German soldiers having recreation. Could you see anything of the shore defences? Uh, we could see some of the big gun batteries uh, in the hinterland behind Wiestrom. In fact, we saw them much better, of course, when the invasion started. We could see them actually firing. And uh, they were gradually um, knocked out by uh, dive bombers or the big battleships, of course, were bombarding at the time. and. Uh, Slowly but surely, they were winkled out. Did the German shore defences look formidable before the invasion? I don't think formidable's the word. It looked... I think everything was hidden. It wasn't until the action started, then you could see what they had really got laid on. At the time, it, uh, it looked uh, a fairly quiet bit of uh, French countryside. What precautions were taken against our own forces mistaking you for a German craft? Well, they were obviously all informed that we were operating, I imagine, hoped. And uh, we took our own precaution. We had a very large white ensign, which as soon as the invasion was on, we, we hoisted this on the 18-foot mast to make sure we were identified as friendly. So that was, uh, that was our own precaution, uh, as we had to weave in and out amongst the invasion force coming towards the beaches. And in the event where you fired on at all? No, not to our knowledge. Or, there or was so much um, gunfire and bits falling everywhere. I mean, I don't imagine we were a worry to the Germans at that stage. There were so many bigger targets. By that time, the commanders were going ashore, the battleships were bombarding destroyers, all forms of ships, the rocket ships, everything was going off. And I should think our little Tichy submarine, which was well trimmed down, um, would be the least of their worries. They had far more to think about. Well trimmed down in what way? Uh, we were well down in the, the, our water line. We, were, we weren't fully at full flotation. So none of the midget submarines were hit? No, both got back completely all right. What did the invasion fleet look like from as, as it advanced on the shore from your point of view? Well literally as you look back towards England there were just ships right across as far as you could see stretching right across as far as your eye could see. They were coming in all forms of ships. Um, very, very frightening. One was very pleased and knew they were on our side. And I think the Germans, who first saw the invasion force, must have really, really been frightened. And you could see the aircraft as well, could you? There were aircraft about all the time. We didn't see any German aircraft, which is interesting. Uh, they were all our own. And to my knowledge, I don't think any German aircraft appeared over the, as far as one could see on that stretch of beach, which covered sword, probably. Had, had the Germans set up anti-submarine defences in the area? Uh, no, no particular anti-submarines. The only thing we had to go through was the mine barrage in the Bay de la Seine. It was a very big mine barrage, and it was essential we went through this submerged, and uh, we, which we did, and only once did we have a, a mine mooring cable scraping down the side of the aircraft. This, of course, was chamfered, so it wouldn't catch on anything, we were well chambered. And uh, apart from that one mooring wire scraping, we didn't uh, touch any others to our knowledge. The danger there would be if you hooked one in any form and you slid up, you might set the mine off, but as long as you kept submerged and down below the mine, you were safe. But that was one of the hazards, was going through the mine barrage. You could actually feel the wire, could you? You hear it, just scraping along the side. It made, because we're assuming, being in the middle of a mine barrage, that it was a mine. It could also have been fishermen's nets or anything, but we assumed it was a mine mooring cable. Just another little bit of interest. Um, while we were sitting on the bottom on the Sunday, 
we heard a high revving craft coming out of Weestrom Harbour <coughs> and this was in fact an e-boat which we learned after the war uh, he went roaring across the channel saw the invasion force when he got across near England and came tearing back and we clocked him in and out we heard him come out and we heard him come back and apparently the CO of this e-boat got on the telephone to naval headquarters and said there's something happening and uh, the answer was from naval headquarters there couldn't be an invasion, the weather was too bad so they did have a chance of doing something in advance but um, they didn't take it What was the weather like on D-Day? Luckily by actual morning of D-Day the weather had dropped considerably but prior to that it was very very rough and I think we were just lucky. I think it was a magnificent uh, effort to have taken the chance. <coughs> I think the poor cr people in the landing craft must have been buffeted about an awful lot in the crossing, because it wasn't until really far into the morning of the 6th of June that the weather became anything like uh, decent. Could you f feel the uh, stormy weather at your depth? Yes, we were only in about 35 feet of water when we were fully submerged, and that was at high tide. So we did get the effect, because we were heavily weighted down. We took in an awful lot of water to keep us on the bottom, and uh, we could feel the effects as we lightened to surface. You could feel the effects of the rollers coming up the long shelving beach. Um, we knew it was still a bit pretty bumpy. How much danger of damage was there to the submarine? Uh, well, under from the, the effect under those conditions. Oh, no, none at all. They just sat nicely on the bottom, and that was it. As long as you took in enough water to keep yourself down, you were quite safe. Just sitting there and uh, waiting. What kind of surface was the bottom? Do you know? Sandy. Yes, sandy bottom. What about the supplies that you had on board? Uh, we just had enough uh, food for up to about a week, I suppose, ten days. We could have gone on longer. The air was the, the main thing. If the air had run out, we would have been in a bit of a predicament. Uh, interesting point there. <coughs> we had these extra large air bottles, and the lightest ones they could find were taken from Luftwaffe bombers. So we were using German air bottles to uh, come back to them. They were the lightest ones. And presumably you went across without armament? We had no armament at all, no. You told me earlier that the normal crew was four. Did you take four across on the D-Day operation? No, on this particular operation we carried a total crew of five. There were three X-Craft crew, a commanding officer, first lieutenant and engineer. We dispensed with our diver, but we carried two combined op pilotage party members to make the crew up to five. Uh, one of the ideas of this was that the commanding officer of the combined op pilotage party was a navigator and that was to ensure that our navigation was absolutely perfect and the other member it was planned that we would launch a rubber dinghy which we would moor between us and the shore with an also an 18 foot mast on it so that they would have a leading light between us the dinghy and the shore but of course, in view of the weather, all attempts at launching his dinghy were abandoned. So the poor chap had a needless journey. You did actually attempt it, did you? No, we, we knew the weather was too, uh, too bad. We could never have moored him up. He would have been up the beach before. So that was abandoned. But that was the original scheme, why we carried the extra man. And was the navigation perfect in the event? Absolutely bang on, yes. Uh, as, it, as it happened, all the churches were still intact and there was even a light at the end of the pier at the mouth of the River Orne. So we were able to make absolutely definite fixes. Session number 2709. Commander Honor, Reel 2. How long were you actually there off the coast on D-Day? We arrived off the... French beaches just after dawn on Sunday 
and we remained there until after the landings on the morning of the Tuesday, June the 6th. And how much of that time would you have been submerged as compared to on the surface? Uh, approximately 18 hours out of each 24 hours. About 36 hours out of the 48. Submerged? Submerged, yes. 36 hours submerged. But we must add the time we took to cross submerged from Gosport to Wiestrom, which was from about 6 o'clock on the Friday night till a.m. on the Sunday morning. It was a very slow passage. We were running at about three knots submerged. And so you were completely undetected, as far as you know, by the Germans? Absolutely, I was completely undetected. What were you doing all the time uh, during that period of 76 hours? Um, some, most of the crew were sleeping, and the others were on watch. Steering, of course, keeping depth, tending the motors or engines. And uh, during the period when we were not actually running, but sitting on the bottom, we were taking it in turns to keep me on watch or to rest, sleep. So, so was it entirely routine? Oh yes, absolute routine, yes. Now, once you'd given the signal that you were due to give to the invasion fleet, what exactly did you do then, step by step? As soon as the um, DD tanks had been launched, we had completed our task. So we cut the anchor rope. We were too exhausted to pull up the anchor. And then we had to rendezvous with our escorting trawler, which was called On Avon. But unfortunately, we failed to rendezvous. And we spent a lot of the time searching for our escort trawler. Eventually we found it, and then we changed over crews. The crew that had been off the beaches transferred to the trawler, and the passage crew took over the X-craft. Who was this passage crew? The passage crew was headed by a Belgian X-craft officer called Victor Monette, and I don't recall the names of the other two, but they purely took over the craft, attached the tow from the trawler, and we set back towards England. Was this uneventful? Uh, the only event I remember, because the captain of the trawler very kindly gave me his cabin, and I was trying to rest, and I thought something was wrong. So I went off on the bridge, and in the confusion of the traffic, I found that we were, we were going back on the outward passage, and all kinds of craft were steaming by each side of us. And this wasn't very safe for the X-craft. So I managed to get the skipper of the, of the trawler to transfer to the, the return passage. That's the only event I remember at the time. When we got back to um, off Gosport, we transferred back into our X-craft and we steamed into HMS Dolphin, the submarine base, with the crew that had originally left. And the base turned out to greet us back with the usual uh, uh, happy greetings that you get when you return from a successful operation. Were there any decorations for, for that day? Yes. Um, the two captains had the DSC, and the two com combined op people also had the DSC, and I think, if I remember rightly, the other members of the crew had a mention. You mentioned um, that about when you got the word for the postponement. Um, who, who sent you that message? This was sent out in a regular broadcast from the BBC and included in the broadcast were certain code words. Um, I can't recall the exact words now, but it was things like Auntie Nelly is arriving on her bicycle and this meant it's postponed. And then there was another set of uh, code for the invasion is on. Uh, 